We're good, yeah, cool. It's the Stromo Show on a Sunday night. Danko Jones are here. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. Nice hey, to see hey, you. George. Hey, nice to see you again. Um, 23 years. Yes. Non-stop. Yeah, never broke up, so never had to reunite, never took a break uh, to do a side project, uh, never went on vacation or anything like that. That's true, yeah. And there's a new band, as a new record, right? There's Ish. a brand new record, just came out about yeah. 10 days ago Rock called Supreme. A Rock Supreme. And it's mostly a love song record? No, it's about mostly about rock. <laughs> Let's play a song, we'll talk to Danko Jones. Dan, 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 Danko Jones. It is the Strombo Show. Um, so, all right, let's let's explore this record. There's a bunch of things we talk about, but let's let's explore the record. Did you know Garth Richardson before? Who produced with you? We only knew his work, Rage Against the Machine. And we were all right? fans of his work. Yeah. And I think for three different bands, JC loves Biffy Clyro. I think I could speak. From yeah, yeah, yeah. Huge yeah. fan of Biffy Clyro, and Rich loved Rage Against the Machine a lot. I, and I, I like uh, the Jesus Lizard album he did, and. We just love pretty much everything he's ever done, and we heard through the grapevine that he was interested in working with us. 
So, I mean, you guys are from the from the first moment I saw you, however many years ago, you seemed like a defined band. You knew who you were, and almost never wavered. Uh, to the point where when you brought out a string section at Lee's Palace for an encore, it was, you did it as a statement, like it was fun, um, but you knew who you were. So how do you, walk, at this stage of your career, walk into uh, a studio with a producer, what's that like getting more out of you, that kind of experience? Oh, at this point, I think, uh, I mean, I'm just, uh, I, from my perspective, uh, I think it's uh, just a matter at this point of getting like the great tones, yeah. great uh, drum sounds, not that we hadn't before, but, and just to go to, through the experience of someone so experienced like Garth. Yeah. And you mentioned that when we first started that we kind of knew who we were. And that's because we were a band who genuinely listened and loved music, uh, listened to a bunch of records, bought a bunch of records, and uh, joined a scene and became part of a scene, which was at the time during the mid to late 90s, there was a real great garage punk scene mm -hmm. uh and uh we got kind of caught up in all that and then as the years went by uh we transitioned into a hard rock band and was the transition normal natural yes yes yeah. definitely when did you get that feeling that that was coming i don't know i, th I think around maybe 99 2000 yeah. What were the um, those records you were talking about that the you know if, if we got a fourteen year old listening right now in Okotoks, Alberta, and who maybe hasn't heard those records because most radio isn't going to play that stuff? What were you listening to that really took took hold inside you to do this band? Just well, just to get you so in love with music, and maybe in those early garage punk days. I mean, to speak directly about the garage punk scene, I would say I don't know about you, JC. I would say. Uh, uh, Pussy Galore albums in Gory's records are a good yeah. start. JC? Yeah, and then later on, Oblivions and, yeah. and you know. And how about when you were like 13, 14, 15? Well, then that was like, you know, for me it was like Beastie Boys when I was a kid, Slayer, Iron Maiden. So those records, I mean, back then you kind of had more of a physical connection with the record where yeah. you'd actually get the record and you'd flip the side. Yeah, God forbid. And, yeah. uh, you know, you'd be following along to liter lyrics and most of the times you'd kind of sometimes I would have to do a mail order so you'd really fall like there'd just be this mystic thing with the uh, with the record it's kind of lost nowadays but on the flip side you have so much access to music which is great so yeah. which can be good so much bad. music out there so. what were you listening to at that age 12 13 14 Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, then I try to find things that were as heavy as I could possibly find. And then Ben transitioned into punk rock. So once I found the Bad Brains, uh, I realized that there's really no rules on music. And then I just kind of got into anything that sounded good to my ears. But it was really uh, getting a Rock for Light by the Bad Brains. Right on. What are you going to play next? My little, my little rock and roll, right. which is not off our new no. album. It's off our last album, yeah. Wildcat. Cool. But we think it's still just as good. <laughs>
Danko Jones on the Strama Show on CBC Music. Um, as, as fans of the, of the genres in rock and roll, does, do genres eternally evolve or do genres ever stop? Well, take the metal genre, for example, and yeah. punk. Yeah. There's a million different subgenres in both. And, but what do you think, totally, what do you think is the next thing of this, though? The, the next version of it? Well, I don't mean to sound like I'm going off on a tangent. Oh, I'm, I'm okay if you do. But I'll bring it back around. <laughs> I just saw of Mike's and Men, yeah. two of the four-part series on the Wu-Tang Clan. Mm -hmm. And uh, afterwards, there was a and a with uh, Sasha Jenkins, a director. Someone asked him a very similar question about where he saw hip-hop going, considering he, he wrote for Spin and he did this Wu-Tang Clan movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, his answer was perfect, which was, uh, it's not for him to decide as a, as he, a 47 year old filmmaker writer, right. if he guessed where the genre is going, which, you know, uh, anticipated what the kids were going to do, then I don't think the kids are doing anything gr like, I don't, I don't think hip hop is going in the right direction and it's always going in the right direction so basically he had no answer so for me i i, I have no answer but what as, as a guy in a rock band we play a very old kind of music there's a there's such a deep discography for the kind of music that we do it's kind of already laid out if you look deep enough right what i wonder is if, if, if on the like i noticed in the last let's say year and a half two years on this show when we were booking younger bands that were coming in i was seeing more girls playing guitars late teens, early twenties, a little bit more dissonance, a little bit more feedback. And I hadn't seen that for a while, but you started to see some of this started to pop back in more guitars are being played. I think for a lot of them, it's because they couldn't where hip hop is now that doesn't resonate with everybody. Not everybody can go out there and be Cardi B. Um, and I wondered if on your road trips and your travels, have you seen things pop up where you're like, Oh, this is neat. Here's what the kids are starting to do. I don't know. For me, uh, I like new rock bands, like bands that just start out that remind me of old rock bands and they're doing <laughs> it in a really, really good way. Like Judah uh, from Italy yeah. is like uh, one of the best rock bands out there and they do a great Slade sweet thing. I don't think they'd get offended by me saying that, right? I mean, yeah, no, no. and Admiral Sir Cloudsley Shovel, both bands are, are uh, label mates. Nice. Uh, but I don't mean to plug the label that much, even though it's rise above, uh, but Admiral <laughs> Sir Cloudsley shovel is, is a great, you know, take on captain beyond and blue cheer. So that's what I personally like. If I see a new band do night flight orchestra is another great new band yeah. that does exactly, you know, harkens back to old styles of rock music. Um, so Tanya Tadak is, was just on the show. And we're going to replay that interview soon. Is there a story out there that you wanted to do a noise collaboration with Tiny Tagak? Is that true? Where did you hear that? It was just sort of floating out there. Is that true? No? Yeah, but nobody knows about that stuff. Well, now, well. <laughs> George, you have done your research. Well, I am, listen, I've been we have doing a good team interviews here. in, I'm not going to say the territory. I almost said Canada. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get anyone pissed off, but like, I'm very impressed. Um, it's a good team on this show. It's a good team. So have you talked to Tanya about this? No, the tracks already. It's done. It's, all the tracks are done. 
oh, we got to hear that. When can we hear that? You're pushing me to finish it. It's on my <laughs> laptop. But okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the scoop here. Yes, give us the scoop, please. Uh, it's uh, Tanya Tagak, and this was done three years ago. Yeah. So it's Tanya Tagak, me, uh, and uh, Jorgen Monkby from Shining, mm -hmm. uh, which is an incredible Norwegian band, and he plays sax on it. They put out a great album that everybody should know called Black Jazz. What was it, five, six years ago? Yeah, excellent album. Yeah. Amazing album. Uh, that flew over everybody's head. At least Dillinger Escape Plan asked him out. Uh, so it was Jorgen and, Jorgen and myself. We asked Tanya Tagak to be on it, and uh, I wanted to get Kaji Hano uh, to do some more uh, vocal, noise vocal on it. Right. And because Kaji Hano is, lives in Japan, he goes through a translator, and it was like I couldn't do, I couldn't get through so uh, not that he's second fiddle at all, mm -hmm. but taking Kajihano's place on the track is Tad Doyle. So. Who you've, you've known for a minute now. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> Tad is doing the vocals that Kajihano is going to do. I mean, he does yeah. his own. And Tad's actually transitioned into uh, just making great uh, noise uh, soundscapes, and oh, opera likes yeah really? like yeah. do me stuff yeah. so now that we've pressured you to finish it what's did you have you're giving me this pressure did you have a plan in your head it's more it's more like encouragement it's more about it's really encouragement to putting it that. out there you're not gonna cut this is this part's not gonna see the cutting room floor no it's going so, on it's pressure it's going that fair enough um, uh, do you have a plan for it well i've always had a thing where i wanted to do a vocal noise record yeah. so i just i would be in the, and it's just a way to uh, kill time on tour. Right. You're in a hotel room. I tend to not leave my hotel room. And so there's lots of things that I could probably do. And I used to carry around mics on tour. So I would make all these no n vocal noise collages. I, I would not stay on the same floor. No, you wouldn't. You just take off. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other thing that I, that, that I heard, I just saw the documentary Hail Satan about the, uh, the, uh, this new uh, satanic temple trying to get religious recognition so that they could enforce the constitution to get things like the 10 commandments off the steps of Capitol buildings, things like that. It's really cool. But in it, they talk about the satanic panic of the eighties and specifically about Dungeons and Dragons and how this whole Christian organization, all these organizations said, if you, if your kids played Dungeons and Dragons, it was a sign that your kids might be into Satanism. And then the other thing I heard was that you wanted to score Dungeons and Dragons. Is that true? No, the Dungeons and Dragons uh, part that involves me. Yeah. <laughs> first of all, the first part is true yeah. because I, I'm a huge D and D uh, fan from when I was a kid. I, right. I used to play it. So yeah, and I worship Satan. Done. So, yeah. <laughs> so that part they were actually tr hit it right bullseye for them. The second part is uh, it's part of my uh, book. There's an article yeah. in there where I mesh uh, heavy metal with uh, Dungeons and Dragons uh, and uh, using uh, heavy metal music as a soundtrack to your right. campaign when you're playing D and D with your friends. And the book is called "I've Got Something to right. Say." Sorry, here, which is a great artwork. So I wondered if you were going to score that. No, no, there's no, no. scoring. I just I just play rock with these guys. <laughs> that's that's, all, right. I, that's well, all I can. And and do noise tracks by myself and sometimes invite people like Tanya Tagak. Which is pretty good. Do you want to uh, play another song? Absolutely. Right on. What's this one? Uh, this song's called Burn in Hell and it's off our new album, A Rock Supreme. Take them out! 
even the score. Wheels keep on turning as I drive. Danko Jones on the Strombo Show. Um, the book says 10 years of rock and roll ramblings. Yeah, it was taken from a 10-year period of writing. Right. 10 years. Do you got more to say? <laughs> yeah, because, uh, <laughs> because it's... I mean, after that. <laughs> it started the... the we took from writings uh, two years into me writing. Right. And then we had to cut it off to uh, meet the deadline of the book. But I still have my columns and when I say we, I mean uh, myself and Aaron Brophy, right. who uh, uh, edited the book. And uh, the forward in this one is by Duff McKagan. Uh, Duff, M sorry, man, I got my earplugs. No, no problem. No, Am I yeah. screaming at you? No, not at all. No, no. Um, so the forward. I'm by not that aggro usually. No, I'm okay with it. The forward's by Duff. Uh, I saw you in Duff's uh, documentary as well, uh, yes. telling stories at that time. The, the the camaraderie is still there with all the that that crew. Which crew do you the, mean? Duff, those, Duff roles in different, many different. No, circles. I mean, I mean, like when, when you guys started, you were you were making your name overseas, especially, and in Toronto, you were talking about you talk about that scene that you were part of around the world. Does that camaraderie still exist? Is that scene still there in its own way? Uh, the world scene. Sorry, I'm <laughs> getting confused. The bands you're in, the music that you were playing, your friends you made back then. Oh yeah, I mean, well, when we yeah. see each other, especially, uh, I mean, the Backyard Babies took us out on a tour in 2001 across Europe, and that really helped us get a, a foothold into Europe and we see them all the time. And when we do, we hang out and we have a great time together. They're wonderful dudes. And I can, I can name you three or four or five other bands that we're, you know, we, we hang in, like, we don't hang out. Yeah. We're on different sides of the, of the pond, but we're very good friends. It's, it's definitely all the touring and being over there and touring the world has helped us, get friends all around the world to the point where we come home, uh, not only have people kind of forgotten who we are because people leave the scene, new people come in and we're gone, but we've also become, you know, we've become strangers to the scene. Like, I don't know what's going on either. So it's a, it's a trade off, but I do it all over again. Cause, cause we got to see the world, you know, we get to do it all the time. So it's, it's great. I can imagine. And I mean, you kind of helped build the scene here. So in a way, one of the great things you can do is just sort of pass it off to the next generation. It's funny because when you're in a band, the only thing you want to do when you start the band is to play for as much people to as far away from home as possible. Yeah. <laughs> and you want to tour, you want to get in a van and tour and go. You just want to join the circus and go. And if you actually achieve that, the fallout of that is you become almost unknown from your starting point. So we have had so many occurrences when we are back home and people come up to us and go, so what happened to you? Like, what, what are you guys doing? Are, what are you, are you still doing, doing that rock thing? Yeah, you still doing that rock thing? 
that happened once and I, 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 you know, we had just finished a great tour <laughs> yeah. overseas, like playing, you know, I, how yeah, did you handle they, that? How did you handle that? Over the years, you know, you you learn to be more classy about it. <laughs> and that comes with age. <laughs> One of my favorite things about you guys, aside from music, which uh, I love, is that you went on stage in a time when no Canadian band had bravado. Like nobody was doing bravado. And then you started showing up at these venues where a lot of shoegazy music was big and it was the bravado matched the sound, and I thought, well, now that's fucking rock and roll. Nobody was doing that, and that's never faded in you. Yeah, I, we had a scene to back us up, though. You know, we yeah. were we had we were part of this garage punk scene. Now, it hadn't it, there were some great Canadian bands that were doing it, but you know, that's what helped us. And when you you mentioned the shoegazing scene that came before us. I mean, it's still here. Like Canada, really has this huge kind of indie kind of shoegazing, not shoegazing, but an indie kind of, uh, kind of folky. It's kind an of aw shucks vibe. vibe. Sorry? It's an aw shucks vibe. Aw oh, shucks yeah. is a great way to put yeah. it. Yeah. And you guys were never that. No, because it, I, I roll for days when I'm <laughs> confronted with it. I can imagine. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having Thanks us. Nice to see you. No, thank you.